Hey folks, Steve here, and uh, we're talking Offside, the Java Panahi film, uh, which is, it's about soccer, but it's not about soccer at all. It's it's essentially about um, fandom and the community around soccer. Now, um, as one of the posters says here, which kind of uh, you know, gives you the plot, uh, in Iran, women are banned from men's sporting events. And it says, uh, in June 2005, Iran defeated uh, Bahrain in, to qualify for the World Cup. That's true. And um, so what he's doing is he's getting a real event and he's creating a fiction around that real event. So the plot, two girls want to go and watch their beloved um, Iran play in this, uh, in this, um, this, um, you know, qualifying World Cup match, but they can't because they're girls. So what they do is they dress up as boys, and uh, then we follow their adventures across the city as they go from being girls to dressing up as boys. And uh, I know what you're thinking, ladies and gentlemen. Let the comedy write itself. It is a comedy um, of sorts, um, but it's also it's a social realist film. It's a it's a sad film. Uh, it's a frustrating film for you know the world that um, these two central characters find themselves in. But it is funny, and um, there's a lot of laughs. And I think you'll enjoy this film. It's very accessible. And um, on the other poster, right, um, which is a bit more um, a risky. This poster, I'll talk about Panahi as a risky director. In, in a second, but uh, here you've got uh, six six girls um, all looking ready um, to participate in the uh, the watching of Iran. And again, because girls aren't allowed, that's a kind of a controversial poster in and of itself. And you won't be surprised to discover that that was the Western poster. And the whole um, the whole problem that the Iranian government has continued to have with Panahi is that he's essentially not making uh, films for Iran. He's he's actually making Iranian films for the West. So he's making very critical um, comments about Iran to sell to the West. And, um, you know, we can discuss that, you know, whether you agree um, with it. But for whatever reason, Panahi's films in the West do really well. He's very popular. He's like this... Uh, film festival darling you know often film festivals in the west pick up uh his films at MIF Melbourne International Film Festival um often play his films and um I don't even go so far as most of his films in the last sort of 10-15 years have actually played at MIF uh in some form or another now um Iranian cinema the, uh, as Tia says, the Iranian cinema is the most critically recognised of cinemas in the West Asian region, but most critical references do not really mention it in relation to Asian cinema. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're probably thinking, hey, Steve, you're an idiot. Iran, Iran. we're talking about Asian cinemas, dummy. Well, <laughs> Iran is in Asia, okay? I've got a map, which I'm about to show you in a second, which is proving that Iran is in Asia, right? So shut up. If you're going to say that. Um, now, what's Theo, uh, Theo, 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 Stephen Theo says, is so strongly is Asian cinema identified with East Asia that Iranian cinema does not readily register in the mind as Asian, which is probably what some of you are thinking, if you're thinking that Iranian cinema is not in Asia or Asian cinema. Now, the problem here is, um, you know, as Theo, Stephen Theo is saying, the influence that most of the Iranian directors have is Europe, Europe, um, art cinema, independent cinema. All right. So their influence isn't actually in Asia in and of itself. Um, so that's a problem. Now, Tio says this, Iranian directors themselves may not have a notion of making films as Asian films, but this does, does not discount the possibility that we may include them into the space of Asian cinema. So if critics writing on, um, uh, Iranian cinema, most of those critics are um, Europeans. If they're talking about Iranian cinema as this thing 
that has closer relationships to Europe. And if the directors themselves are tying um, what they're doing, their cinema, to uh, Europe, um, what's going on with Asia and putting them into this category of Asian cinemas, is it fair to compare them to other Asian directors? Now, um, as you will see, you know, directors, you know, numerous Asian directors are influenced by uh, European cinema. You know, Wong Kar Wai being, uh, you know, another really good contemporary example. But if these directors aren't making, uh, you know, films where they're actually considering them as part of the Asian cinema, um, what does it say about authenticity in that they're trying to make an authentic Asian film and also the Asian experience? What, you know, what is the Asian experience if this film kind of feels like it's not um, part of Asia? You know, it's actually something else or somewhere else. You know, these otherizing. And um, you just have a think about that uh, when you're uh, watching through the film. All right, now, to shut everybody up, um, here is the map of Asia. And as you'll see, um, Iran is there. Um, if you Basically, if you're in India, just drive. Drive towards Pakistan and just keep driving. So drive through Pakistan and you'll hit Iran. And then if you keep driving, uh, you'll hit, hit Iraq, Syria, and you could even um, kind of divvy up to Turkey. I mean, if you're in Iraq or Syria, I'd head down to um, Egypt, which apparently fantastic. Who wouldn't want to go to Egypt? So, um, you know, there's numerous places you could drive to uh, if you wanted to. Um, but my pick would be Mongolia. Now, I've never been to Mongolia, but uh, surely it's great. I mean... Mongolian food, terrific, great music, uh, the people that I've seen, you know, like as being represented on the screen, seem very friendly. So um, I'm I'm just saying, um, if you if you're thinking of going somewhere um, in Asia, go to Mongolia. Um, but Iran is definitely there in Asia. Okay, so there you go. Now. Uh, a couple of things about the director, Java Panahi, who sort of, um, he's become this sort of, uh, you know, identity. Um, he's sort of cast himself in a lot of his own films for reasons, um, which I'll get to in a sec. Okay, so, so Panahi's making these films like Offside. Offside is a good example, where he's making very critical films about the Iranian government. And you will see this film, he's basically saying, this whole banning about women not being able to get into sports games is bullshit. I mean, it's just crazy, crazy bad, right? So I'm actually going to make a film that's mocking the government and I'm going to show two girls. Oh, I'm not going to tell you what happens at the end, but let's just say that uh, victory is not just won on the sporting field. Okay, now, so Panahi was doing all of this, he was making all these kind of controversial films, and then he was arrested uh, in March 2010 along with his wife and his daughter, and 15 friends. So you don't want to be friends with Panahi, because you could get arrested as well. Um, they were later charged with propaganda against the Iranian government. Right. Uh, now, despite support from filmmakers, film organisations, and human rights organisations from around the world, in December 2010, Panahi was sentenced to a six-year jail sentence. Um, he was put under house arrest. And then the, the real kicker, was 20-year ban on directing any movies, writing screenplays, giving any form of interviews with Iranian or foreign media, or from leaving the country except for medical treatment. Now, um, so we get to his filmography. And can I just say, this filmography, right, is, you know, fantastic. If you're a director, this is the sort of filmography you're looking for. You know, really, really terrific films. So he's making these controversial films um, early on. The White Balloon um, is, is considered by many his masterpiece. The Mirror, um, which I have done another lecture on, which I'll um, link you to at the end, uh, which I like a lot. The Circle is, you know, really fantastic. Crimson Gold, terrific. Offside, um, close to a masterpiece. And then he gets arrested in 2010. And he makes a film called This Is Not A Film. Again, I've done a lecture on that. Uh, because the thing is, they said, well, you can't make a film, Panahi, 
no film for you. And he said, oh, okay, so, uh, you know, what's a film? Well, like, how would you define a film? And they're like, well, you know, if you've got a camera crew and you got actors. And he's like, right, fine, no problem. So he goes and shoots this documentary of him in his house on his iPhone. And then he puts the film, so it's just him just talking about, you know, hey, I'm under house arrest, this is what I'm doing, blah, blah. He talks about um, some of his films. He talks about a film that he wants to make, which is kind of interesting. He then puts the film on a USB. He puts the USB in a cake. He sends the cake to Khan. And then they, you know, they find the USB in the cake and they played the film at Khan. And that's why it's called This Is Not A Film, because it's not a film, because he was told what a film is and he didn't do that. Anyway, so he becomes the star of the film. And then he becomes the star of his other films, sort of putting himself in his films. And even the films where, um, you know, aren't necessarily documentaries, he sort of become the, the star of his films because he can't really work with other directors. And his most recent film is Three Faces, which um, seems to completely go against everything I said. Um, you know, the Iranian government might want to check in on that film because as far as I'm concerned... It's um, pretty much um, not 20 years um, up yet. But, you know, I think uh, things are being laxed uh, to the point where, you know, he's free to make films again. Okay. Um, so that's Banahi. So he's, you know, he's a controversial filmmaker. So when you're watching Offside, um, you should really be watching the film as the way that he is politically challenging um, the government and certainly their... Um, well, it's not just the government. It's it's just a cultural kind of traditional thing, um, you know, which Panahi's going against. And he's sort of saying, we've got to be a bit more progressive here and actually think outside the square and think more globally. What does that actually say and how does that represent Iran to the world? And this is the problem that government have. It's like you're giving a depiction of Iran to the world, which may not be fair in the you know, certain traditions and religious views, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's um, important to know, I think, going into this film, just knowing what you've got here. Okay, now, uh, Stephen Teo's article on Iranian cinema, which doesn't mention Panahi, but it mentions sort of Iran and, you know, what's actually happening with that um, cinema. And it's a really, really terrific uh, chapter. Now, he talks about space and space being just so important to, um, to Iranian, Iranian cinema and... Um, also, Adrian Danks's piece, which I've, I've linked uh, into the readings as well. And, you know, he talks a lot about uh, space in the film, in the film of, uh, of, of Osside. Now, the first question, what do we learn about the spaces we are shown? So the film is, it's an exterior film as far as it's got the characters and they're basically in the city and they're moving across the city. All right. So think about where are we? What are we shown? How are we shown it? Right? What or where are these spaces? Right? The thing is, the film wants you to think that you're pretty much watching a documentary. Right? The places are real. The people are real. Most of the people in the film are not actors. They're actually real people just doing their thing. Right? Why is he doing that? Well, he's essentially doing that to kind of show you the real world, the real Iran. And he's kind of fictionalizing um, particular aspects of that. Uh, now, for the characters, the spaces are familiar yet dangerous. And I think that's important. So the, the two central um, um, characters, um, they sort of become the surrogate viewer because what they're doing is they're showing us places they know, but they're also showing us places that they shouldn't be going because there's this whole thing of segregation and, you know, women are allowed in some places and not other places and, you know, all, all of this stuff. And it's really interesting how space is being used, but he really gets gives you a good sense of this world and this space. And it's, it, it's interesting because it's a closed world for these characters, but it's actually not... Um, you know, they, they, they move quite freely across the city, which also might subvert, you know, particular ideas or myths that we ha maybe have about um, women moving in the city in Iran. Okay, now, um, here are... Here's one character. Interestingly, 
Panahi's often showing you these characters, but he's often kind of framing them in a way that makes them seem trapped. Now, they may be outside, uh, like, you know, the first image, but he'll kind of do it behind bars, you know, to show that they're actually, they're the ones being imprisoned. Although they can't get in somewhere and they can move quite freely outside of the sporting ground, well, they can sort of move kind of freely, right? It, it, they're constantly trapped and they can only move so far. Now, Teo, oh, the reason why I'm playing, I'm showing you these clips, is Teo talks about the faces. And the thing about Iranian cinema and Panahi is he can say things, but he can't say other things. And what Teo's saying is the faces generating in a speech are sources of effect range from happiness to sadness, indifference to shock. Now, what he's saying is to really get what's going on with the film politically and the way that the characters are subverting this and also the kind of piss take in a way that it's having of a run. You've actually got to watch what isn't being said, but watch what is shown and the way that it's shown and the way that Panahi shows you a face, holds on the face and actually lets the face reveal really what's going on for these, for these characters, um, which I think... You know, it's 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 clearly there. It's hard to articulate, but it's clearly there. And um, because it's hard to articulate, let's try and articulate it um, when we um, get together. Now, um, the the Tio is kind of talking about um, Ozu, right? And um, okay, so Iranian. This is a quote: Iranian directors offer a methodology of seeing that we can compare with that of Ozu. Ozu being the uh, classic uh, Japanese director. If we take Ozu as the father of the iconic look, right, and in this methodology of the iconic look, there is a sense of Asian seeing. Okay, so what's this Asian seeing? Is it us seeing Asia? Is it the characters seeing themselves or other things in a particular way? Is it the directors seeing Asia um, in a particular way? Now, Ozu's distancing aesthetics is a methodology of seeing that formulates inward space. Inward space. What does inward space mean? Now, inward space doesn't just mean inside or interior. And um, uh, Danks's piece, which doesn't talk about um, Teo's book, um, you know, it doesn't talk about inward, but he actually talks about the way that interiors are used um, and the inwardness of this world. So even when you're outside in particular sections of the city, he, he's sort of show, he's actually not showing you everything that he could show you. There's a sense of, you know, it's a very small space that he's showing you um, in the world, which is interesting because he wants you to feel kind of trapped in, in, in itself and there is a sense here I think of both writers talking about the inwardness of the space that it's not an external space it's an inward space and what do we actually mean by that are there examples that we can actually use of that um, this is the inward space and Danks talks about like you know if a character is on a bus and the character gets off the bus instead of the camera just following the character off the bus the camera will stay on the bus and watch the character from inside the bus, right? And why why does Panicky make that choice? What's actually going on? You know, the camera doesn't actually go at times where the characters go. Yeah, it actually stays um, kind of more inwardly, um, if you if you if you will. Now, um, Ozu, think about any comparisons you, you may make to Ozu, and the way that Ozu. He kind of he's always representing a bigger, broader world, but at the same time, he's not. He's um he's actually showing you these characters within a broader world, but they're kind of little spaces and little places. And although um this film's different to say a typical Ozu film, you know where um your typical Ozu film is actually inside a house, a home, a family. Um, this is about characters wandering across spaces. Um, Teo finds there to be a comparison in the way that he's playing with sort of inward space, um, seeingness, and also just experiencing um, places, but also 
what you're not shown. You're not kind of given the whole whole environment, the whole world. Okay, uh, it's just some final questions. Uh, what is the message of this interaction between looker and viewer, right? So we're the viewer and the looker in, um, you know, characters in the film. What are we to make of this female gaze which confronts us with a challenge, right? The female gaze, what's actually going on here? Um, just the point of view that relates directly to the point of view. Who owns the point of view as in, you know, is the camera telling the point of view from these female characters? Is it giving you a broader um, perspective? Does the point of view shift? And the film actually does shift. And I think what's really interesting is that he actually, there's sort of this, um, he, he gets a sense that everybody in this world in a way is trapped. You know, even the soldiers whose job is to actually keep the girls outside of the game. All right. uh, how's the camera used? When doesn't it follow the central leads? And, you know, back to that kind of example of the bus, you know, camera staying on the bus. Um, I think it's really interesting um, what's going on. Also, what's fascinating about this film is sound. And sound is used in a way, right, to indicate to us and show us um, what these characters are being excluded from, what these characters are being segregated from, right? And sound, like so sound at the soccer game, for instance, like when they're outside the ground and you can hear just the roar and the excitement from inside and the fact that they are being denied that experience and that joy and that culture, you know, which is a very kind of harrowing and very sad. And I just finally, how are these exterior locations being used to really give us a sense of this world, this Asian world, and um, also you know, their, their place within the world, but also their exclusion from this world. All right. Um, oh, no, there's one more thing. Oh, yeah, here's, um, here's me. These are other lectures I've done on Pan English. One on the mirror and one on This Is Not A Film, um, which is on YouTube. So um, there you go. Um, okay, so I'll leave it there. And uh, I, uh, I think Offside's just a really, it's a really terrific film. It's a film that really stays with you. It's funny in parts. It's tragic in parts. It's extremely um, enjoyable and watchable. Um, it's probably, you know, I'd like to say it's his most popular film. Um, but you know, often when I make these statements, I always have people telling me that is not true. So I won't say it's his most pop most popular film. But it should be his most popular film because it's extremely accessible. Um, I think you'll like it a lot. All right. So um, I look forward to watching this film um, uh, with you. Um, and on that. Bye for now.